could stand up, sit down, and shout sometimes when I'm reading this. Anyway, today's proclamation text is, text is from Philippians, the third and fourth chapter. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, what is ahead I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They're all standing so they can sit. (laughs) Grace, peace, and love to you from Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and the one who gives us our true purpose in life. Amen. Did you notice how we were doing our singing up here? They were practicing safe physical distancing. So it was awesome. So thank you all for doing that. And out there, you can't see it, but they are also doing safe physical distancing. So we want to do that. And we want to use that term physical because I think social distancing gives us the wrong impression, right? Because we are still online. We're still coming together socially in many ways. So we want to continue to use the term maybe physical distancing because we can't get near each other. However, we are still social creatures. So welcome to our online worship. We are in week two now of our somewhat new normal, if you will. We want to, again, formally welcome St. Matthew Lutheran Church. They're in uh, Bully's Quarters, right? Yep, awesome, Middle River. Pastor John, who led our call to worship and is going to lead us again in uh, uh, part of our prayers for healing after our, our time. We just really enjoy the fact that we're able to come together as a worship body and celebrate uh, worshiping our Lord and Savior together. So we, we really want to invite them to do this more often, and maybe we can do this even when our norm normal resumes. I know Pastor John's actually come here and done some preaching, and I've gone there. It's really kind of been a, a great thing. He's been a great mentor as we've changed our new time, our period here to Maryland. So, really want to just welcome them as part of that. So, if you're just joining us, though, we've been walking through the last couple of weeks the book of Philippians. And we're walking through a five-point series of which we're called uh, How to Live. Walking Living is what we're calling it. And our, our themes have been fairly simple. We're going to give you a quick review so at least you can kind of get caught up. Uh, it's really about how Jesus wants us to live. And Paul has written this book of Philippians and given us tremendous insight on how we can live our lives fully to Christ. We began looking at our lives from a different perspective than the rest of the world. We talked about how it means to live with perspective actively looking at everything that is happening in our lives from God's perspective. Not trying to understand God, of course, that's not our place, but to submit to his will and see things from his perspective at all times, including times of chaos as we are walking through. Well, this then ended up leading us into a discussion in week two on how to live with serenity among these times of chaos, perhaps, because the approach that we take is God is in control and God is leading us. And that helps us know that there's a reason for everything, and we lay it in God's hands, allowing us to look at things that happen in our lives that might be going sideways with a little bit more peace and tranquility than the rest of the world. And so last week then, we looked at how we can be unified with each other in, with, and under Jesus Christ moving us forward. We saw that we have different approaches, of course, to to lives, 
But when we have one God and one Savior, we are all united together under that one will to live. So we make better choices then because we have him leading us. We look at our neighbors more instead of ourselves. And the focus really becomes about others and moving the kingdom of God into other people's lives. And it's not just about us because we understand that our lives have been changed and radically transformed by the ever-living and everlasting sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we want others to know then how we have been changed in that way. So, you're pretty much caught up. <laughs> Welcome to, to week four. This is, again, our Walking Living series. We're looking at how we're alive in Christ, living into that eternal pro uh, promise of everlasting life through this look at Philippians. So grab your Bibles, turn to Philippians, and we're going to get together looking at how to live with purpose this week. Living with purpose. And so purpose is this. The reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. Right? The reason for which something is done or created or which something exists. If you Google um, quotes about purpose, just do that, you're going to get many, many options. I think it was over 2 billion that were listed. I don't know if there's that many. But that obviously tells you there's a big question in that world that we live in. Because the world loves to ask this question. What is my purpose? Why am I here? There are aisles of books dedicated to this topic. Uh, there are thousands of self-help videos that will walk you through this journey of how to find yourself and exploring what your purpose in the world truly is. But it's an extension, quite frankly, of the old age question. What is the meaning of life? Right? Like it or not, we are all looking for something. Some of us find it. Others don't. And I'm not wanting to sound like one of those self-help leaders, of course, but in many ways, we find our purpose in life. When we do that, we tend to, to look at life differently and things fall into place a little bit better. Right? Um, but I did go ahead and Google, practice what I preached, Googled some quotes about purpose, found a few that might sound familiar, and of course, I did my best to make sure they were actually attributed to who said them. Uh, but nonetheless, here we go. Winston Churchill, we believe, said this. It's not enough to have lived. We should be determined to live for something, right? Some kind of purpose out there. Uh, Dostoevsky also wrote, The mystery of human existence lies in not just staying alive, but finding something to live for. Right? And Thomas Carlyle finally wrote, The person without a purpose is like a ship without a rudder. Right? When you have purpose in your life, you know where you're heading. You know where you're moving. It does feel like in many ways, if you don't have purpose, that you're just kind of floundering. We get that. So what does it mean then to live with purpose? Well, there's many thoughts, there's many theories, but what we tend to do here in our Christian circles is look to Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus had a purpose, right? Jesus knew his path. This Lenten season, uh, we, we journey to the cross, right? We walk with Jesus as he knew this was his path before us. His perspective was focused on that coming kingdom and what his journey to the cross meant for the world. He was not going to be deterred. He was going to there for us, for you, for me, for the world, so that the world could be saved. He knew that the glory of God would be revealed in his death and the ultimate resurrection. This was his purpose. Now, we actually get insights into thinking and into seeing how he thinks about this. And we're going to see glimpses of this holistic approach that we take here in the Gospels. So we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, follow along. If not, it should be on the screen here in a minute. So Mark 9. As Jesus went along, he saw a blind man from birth. And so his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And the man went and washed, and he came home seeing if you continue to read on, uh, which the lectionary would have us do today, you'll, you'll see the interaction then between the Pharisees and him and the, the unbelief that this man was truly uh, led to be seen. So there's still, in that world, a lot of unbelief for what Jesus can do for us. But what we want to really look at is Jesus' 
focus right now. He says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Night is coming and no one will work, right? But his focus, his purpose was to love those whom he walked with and to change their lives and announce that the kingdom of God was at hand. His purpose was to make the journey to the cross for you and for me and for all of humanity. But the key understanding that he shared with his disciples and now leaves us, shares this with us, is that no matter the circumstances that life throws our way, whatever blindness is out there for us to participate in, it can all be used to show forth God's glory, to show forth God's power, to show forth the kingdom of God, including a pandemic. So, as we have been walking through Philippians, Paul's been spending a lot of time sharing what his vision of a Christian life might look like, or how we can live into this Christian life. We hear the words today, pressing on for the goal. And this is really the key to understanding what our purpose really is. The goal is that purpose, all right? The goal is the resurrection life. It's living into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The purpose is, is living for the kingdom of God. Making disciples for that kingdom because we have faith in the resurrection. It is walking with others in love as Jesus has walked with others, changing lives and providing a hope that can only be found in him. That is a purpose. Now that purpose again is reiterated and reinforced in Matthew 28, Jesus' great commission as he is leaving us. His co-mission, if you will what we get to do with him on his behalf, to go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. That is the command and the promise that we as followers of his get to live into. And yet we still continue to let other purposes guide our lives. Our lives in North America tend to be simply a search for purpose because we forget the one true purpose that's already there for us. We hear people who are in life say they found their purpose, and they tend to be happier, right? Well, William, William Barclay, who was a theologian, wrote this about purpose. He wrote, the two most important days in your life are the day that you are born and the day you find out why, right? And I love that approach. It's really the pro- approach that we as Christians take, that we, as Paul kind of wrote to us, but it's something different than what our American lives would want us to live into. But that day we found out why is the day that we were saved. The day that we celebrate as baptized members of the body of Christ. Because when we have that purpose then, our relationship with Jesus Christ, our purpose changes. It truly defines who we are. Uh, There's an analogy that I like that helps us understand the big picture of what the big purpose is. Uh, It's this story. In the late 1800s, no businesses truly matched the financial and political dominance of the railroad. The railroad industry was huge. Trains dominated the transportation industry, replaced the Pony Express in many ways, other things that had been going on. Well, it was moving goods and people throughout the country. Well, then this newfangled discovery came along, right? The car. And incredibly, the leaders of the railroad industry didn't take advantage of their unique position to participate, to participate in this new transportation development. And so a gentleman, Tom Peters, wrote a book. It's called The Search for Excellence. And he points out the reason why. He says the railroad barons didn't understand the business they were in. Right? He observes that they thought they were in the train business. They were doing it well, but they thought they were in that business. But they were, in fact, in the transportation business. So then, focused only on train and not transportation, time passed them by, as did opportunity, and they couldn't see what their real purpose was. This is our lives in a nutshell. What is our business? What is our purpose? Folks, we are in the gospel business. All right? Not the Lutheran business or the Catholic or the Methodist business, but the gospel business. We can't miss the big opportunity, the big purpose, in searching what feels only good to us in our world. We get caught up in our own things, but all that has been changed for us, right? 
Right now we're worshiping in our homes. Right now we're, our buildings, our traditions, our rituals, in many ways, have all been stripped down and removed from us. We are left only with the purpose, the gospel, right? The worship of our Lord and Savior. That is what we need to remember. So in our reading, Paul is asking the Philippians and us then to look at that big picture, to see where it is we're truly going and how we're going to get there. And he predicates this all with one word, humility. So first he says this. He says there is humility about the past, not just in his pre-Christian days, but in his previous Christian walk, He emphasized that no matter what he's done, how far he's come, how great of a Jew he was, it didn't matter because that's not keeping him there. Because he hasn't quite reached his destination. He forgets, is what he says, about what's behind him. He doesn't rest on his laurels and things that, accomplishments that he's already done in those past triumphs. That keeps him humble. It keeps him focused on what's to come. So humility about the past is a big part of this. The second major aspect of this quest follows logically. While he's forgetting about what is in the past, he presses on toward what is ahead. So there's a diligence about the future. He is diligent toward that future. In fact, he seems to be looking forward, not just some earthly attainment of spiritual maturity or knowledge, but quite frankly, to the moment when God is going to call him heavenward. That's when he ultimately reaches his prize. That's when we all reach that final prize, when we are called home to be with Jesus Christ. In between all of that is our mission. That is our time, our opportunity, our purpose. Paul emphasizes that everyone who is mature should have the same attitude. In other words, anyone who thinks that they're mature or that they've already arrived at their destination is actually fooling themselves. Life in Christ is the journey of all journeys. And it allows us to live, when we're humble, into that holistic stewardship we talk about. When we are growing and moving deeper into our relationship with Christ, we continue to find that we aren't in charge. Humility leads us. It keeps us humble. And we find that humility in all that we do, allowing us to see that all that we are and all that we have has been given to us by God. It's all to be used for his glory. That's the purpose. That's living into the gospel. But it holds its key in that maturity piece. Maturity helps us to keep focused on the prize. Uh, We want to openly say that maturity is not a destination, but a journey. Life today is meaningful because of where we are headed tomorrow. The purpose of living into the resurrection is, The purpose is living into that and to bring as many people along with us so they can experience that life as well. Our future destination in heaven should define our actions here on earth, our journey. We talked about a few weeks ago. If we truly believe that heaven is better than what we have here, our focus is all about that. How we travel has everything to do with where we are going. So if we hold God's perspective, it helps us keep that serenity about our lives amid the storms, going to help us look at others as equals in the eyes of God and allow us to go then and reach them through that unity of Christ. All this kind of fits together. It's amazing. So let's look at how to do this, right? If the resurrection is the goal, Paul is actually going to give us a map in this particular reading how to get there. And we're going to talk about moving forward because that is what we are doing, right? We are always moving forward. Forgetting what's behind, not dwelling on the past. And he says that in verse 13. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Right? So this is how he, he frames this whole piece that we're going to talk about. We've got five ways that we're going to look at this. So when we submit to Jesus Christ, our accomplishments in life don't matter. Because we leave them behind and we move forward. So we're moving forward in this way. Toward a God-defined goal. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. We are moving forward into God's defining momentum, if you will. That's the gospel message, first and foremost, the purpose. And then we do that with a God-shaped heart. He says in verse 18, For as I have often told you before, and I now tell you again with many tears, many live as enemies of the cross. 
Do we weep for those who don't know Jesus Christ? Paul did. That's the passion he had to drive the gospel into other people's lives. That's why when he sat in prison, people around him knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because among his circumstances, he proclaimed Christ crucified. Right? Do we weep over those who don't get it? Because as Paul puts it then, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And their mind is set on earthly things. That's what happens when people don't know Jesus Christ. So, we're moving toward that God-defined goal with a God-shaped heart that allows us to want others to be a part of what we are. But we do it then with a God-empowered strength. Right? Living in what we have already attained. That strength comes from our citizenship in heaven. Verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. I know the census is going around. We've got to fill out and do our, our duty to our country. But our true citizenship is in heaven. Living in what we have already attained, built on what has been done for us. We are baptized. Right? So we take that strength then, and it produces this God-sized hope. We eagerly await the Savior, living in anticipation of this resurrection, actively waiting And we do it with that God-focused confidence. That's the last one. We stand firm. We hear in verse 21, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. God-focused confidence is faith. So doing this, moving forward toward that goal that defines, you know, that God-defined goal with that God-shaped heart by God-empowered strength with a God-sized hope. And really with that God-focused confidence, that's how we move forward. That's our purpose, right? Have you found God's purpose for you? We heard Christian just talk about it for the kids, asking them to find their purpose. Parents, you can help them in a bigger way by making sure they have a faith in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose above all purposes. Have you found God's purpose for you? Not what you're good at, but your purpose of living into the resurrection that's going to move you forward and help you with that humility piece. Because if you have, then you know how to live your life with the purpose that God has already given you. If you're still struggling with this purpose, the purpose of making disciples and following Jesus Christ, then we have actually been given now a perfect opportunity to work on it. It's called COVID-19. This pandemic has disrupted our lives. It's changing our work, our play, our fun. It's allowed us to look at how many things we truly put before God in front of him. We lovingly call them idols, right? But this virus has forced us to reevaluate our lives and to see what's truly important. The virus has taken away all of those idols. It's removed our sports, our travel, our money. What do we have left? God. Now more than ever, we must turn back toward God. And this doesn't have to be one of these prophetic end of days events. I don't believe it it truly is. But what it is doing is giving us an opportunity to recenter our lives around the one thing that does matter the most, gospel living, our Savior, right? We've been given an opportunity to move deeper into our relationship with Jesus and to make sure our families understand what that really means. But it's simply an opportunity, folks. Scary, uncertain, yes. But I can't help but look at this from God's perspective and see how all of the distractions in life that we always put in front of God are now gone. We're going to see those who are moving toward maturity in Jesus Christ and those who are going to struggle with what's truly happening because they're simply drinking the milk of infancy. It's time to get back to the true purpose of God, the resurrection. This is no coincidence that it's happening during Lent. But it really has caused us to ask these big questions. Why is this happening? What is the purpose of a pandemic? Why is God allowing this to happen? All big questions. But are we asking the right questions? The disciples, again in our reading, asked, what was the purpose of the blind man? Who caused 
him to sin? Or why was he blind? Was it his parents' sin? Was it his sin? Do you notice what Jesus did? He shifted their thinking. He changed their approach. He went from being fixated on the problem to taking it to the other level. So this is where we are. Are we fixated on our problem? Can we really shift our thinking and focus to the glory of God? We already have the purpose. We already have the answer. We have to ask the question, how can we help show forth the glory of God? That's what Jesus said about the blind man. Nobody, it was nobody's fault, but what has happened to him is to show forth the glory of God, the power and the majesty of Jesus Christ. And so this is where we're at. We have an opportunity among this COVID to show forth the glory of God. The opportunity is for us to stop putting our hope in the created things and instead trust the one who created it all. We are citizens of that kingdom, and we have the only purpose that truly matters, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for sending us your Son, the true reason, the true purpose that we have in life. Though we still struggle with things around us that feel uncertain, we know that because we have that faith in you and faith in the eternal kingdom that you have promised us, that we can continue to move forward. Not frozen, stuck where we're at, but to move into your kingdom. And so we ask that you continue to walk with us as you have promised you have. To help calm us so we can go out and be the gospel to others. Help us fulfill our purpose. Amen. Folks, thanks for checking us out. Thanks for watching. Trinity is a discipleship-driven worship community. We'd love for you to come and be a part of this community as we uh, celebrate who Jesus Christ is in our lives. Uh, check us out on our website, trinityjapa.org. Uh, please go there, or we have plenty of social media outlets you can check us out as well on. Uh, if you'd like to physically come and see us, we'd love that as well. And uh, we have services on Sundays at 9 o'clock is our traditional service. We have a contemporary service at 11 o'clock. And we're really in, in looking forward to our second Saturday celebration service. It's the second Saturday of the month at 5 o'clock where we'll come together and, and worship. But plenty of outlets, plenty of ways to reach one another to connect with one another, and we'd invite you to do so with us. Love to have you. So in the meantime, go in peace. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks.